Good evening, everyone. I feel very thankful that we have a, a good amount of people in this room, so thank you. Um, my name is Amy Shapiro. I'm the Director of Programming and Engagement at the Anderson Collection. First, I'd like to recognize that Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Mwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. I'm so pleased to present this program to you tonight in collaboration with the Department of Art and Art History. We bring together two unique artists, Squeak Carnwath and Gregory Rick. These painters of different generations and experiences share deep commitment to painting a medium that both use to express their anxieties, fears, humor, and histories. Both artists graduated from the California College of the Arts and Gregory from Stanford just last year with his MFA and have received SF MoMA's prestigious SICA, Society for the Encouragement of Contemporary Art, award, Squeak in 1980 and Gregory in 2023, recognizing emerging artists of the Bay Area. Instead of a simple artist conversation where we've given the artists a set of questions to be prepared to answer, we've kind of done the opposite. Everyone who registered the event should have gotten an email asking them if they had any questions for the artists. So after each artist talks about their work for about 10 minutes, they'll take the stage. Um, the Anderson Collection's esteemed director, Jason Linetsky, um, will pose some of these questions to Squeak and Greg Gregory that were pulled from a hat earlier this afternoon. <laughs> we like to keep them on their toes. Um, after the program, we invite everyone to continue the conversation at the Rose and Crown Pub in Palo Alto, where Squeak and Gregory would love to eat french fries and drink beer with you. <laughs> Though I'm not sure what they actually will eat and drink, I thought it sounded cute. So. <laughs> um, a big thank you to Ileana Tejada from the Anderson Collection, who is the mastermind behind this program, and Julianne Garcia from the Department of Art and Art History, who helped make this possible. Squeak Carnwath draws upon the philosophical and mundane experiences of daily life in her paintings and prints, which can be identified by lush fields of color combined with text, patterns, and identifiable images. She has received numerous awards, including the Sika Award from SF MoMA, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and many more. Carnwath is Professor Emerita at the University of California, Berkeley and we love her anyway, it's okay. <laughs> Gregory Rick received his BFA also from California College of the Arts in 2019 and graduated from Stanford with an MFA in art practice in 2022. Developing a historical imagination and fondness for drawing stories, Rick collapses history while confronting his own personal trauma. His works exist as reflections of his personal experience while also in dialogue with the wider world. Rick has received the Combat, the Combat Infantry Badge, the Nathan Oliveira Fellowship, and the Sika Award, among others. Rick is currently teaching here at Stanford. So now I'd like to invite Gregory Rick up to share his work. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, yeah, so i just like to talk about um, a series of images I have. I, I, I think like this image is important to me because it's one of the only images I have from uh, my time in, in Iraq. So I served in Iraq in uh, 2005, 2006 with the 101st Airborne Division. This is uh, in a fighting position on MSR Tampa, which is the main road that goes from uh, north to south in the country. <clears throat> um, so, the, like leading up to this moment, like a lot of, I guess a lot of things have happened. And a lot of things have happened since this moment. Um, I, f I first found myself uh, using drawing or uh, recognizing drawing when I was young, maybe about seven years old. My father, uh, around that time, my father went to prison. He shot a guy and went to prison for manslaughter and he wasn't uh, in my life for about 10 years. But there was a bookshelf in, in our house that was kind of like, you know, this sacred space. Um, so I would sneak there and look at books. And some of the books that he left in particular were these kind of cheesy uh, 
books on military history, kind of encyclopedia books, um, World War II in color type things. And I, I found myself, you know, drawing out of these books. I was really uh, attracted to the illustrations and I find myself drawing the tanks and the airplanes. And this was kind of like my first uh, foray into to drawing. And I felt like it was kind of like, also like a means of like connecting with my father, even though he was gone. Uh, and when he was there, you know, a lot of times he would seem kind of distant. And my mom, you know, told me he wasn't really the same after he came back from Vietnam. And I, um, so I felt like, you know, maybe if I could just understand this military thing and I could, you know, have some kind of connection with him. And, you know, he kept me going, you know, throughout, you know, reinforcing things. Like he, he would draw a little bit too. He was always drawing better tanks than me when I was seven. And he would, me and him shared the same birthday, uh, September 20th. And he would send me drawings of two tanks. And it'd be one big tank and one little tank. And it'd be like father and son. And, you know, so a lot of times I, I felt my, found myself in, in, in competition with him um, to, you know, create a better tank drawing. You know, he, he told me he's playing chess, so I started playing chess. Um, I guess so I could beat him when he got out. You know, I, I don't know. And then, you know, later on, he did. He, he got out and... Um, I uh, played him in chess and I and I won, you know, and that's after I was in the chess club for a minute and, you know, I was maybe about 17 and, um, but I still felt like he didn't recognize me as like, a, as an equal, even though we came from the same place. And I thought that was mainly because I, I, I wasn't a man and I thought that a man was um, kind of wrapped up in violence. And I thought the better you could execute violence, the fiercer you were would make you a better man. And I seen him always as a, you know, kind of like, I guess, an archetype for that. You know, even before Vietnam, he, he had been, you know, in gunfights, been shot, you know, shot people probably. Um, and then, you know, whatever he did in Vietnam, which he only talked about a monkey jumping on him. Um, yeah, so also during this time, they, uh, I guess, ended the school art program in Minneapolis, Minnesota, that's where I'm from. They ended the school art program, which was my favorite classes. And after that, I found myself, like, kind of, I started to recognize, like, this kind of mystic, or, you know, kind of cryptic language that was on the streets, you know, on my walk to school. It was like graffiti, so I found myself getting drawn into graffiti because that was the accessible art form. And I did that for a number of years, and uh, maybe about two years before I joined the Army, right when I turned 18, I was uh, arrested, you know, in charge of a, a felony from um, Amy Kobachar, uh was the uh, district attorney at the time, and she wouldn't let me plead down the felony for graffiti. So, you know, that was hard. And so this, joining the military kind of solved things in my mind. It was... I could get rid of the felony, because the recruiter told me so, and, you know, I guess uh, Amy Kovachar signed off on that. And I could also become a man. That's, that's what I thought. Um, so, I don't know if either of the, well, I got rid of the felony, right? But then, then I also kind of picked up a lot of stuff, you know, I mean, I, a lot of things, uh, like, Fighting um, in a combat situation, fighting in a war, a kinetic war, is is really different from reading books about it um, as a seven-year-old. And a lot of the things, you know, I feel like I had a lot of lucky draws, you know, but some bad ones too. And I just kind of left it uh, where I couldn't really, you know, recoup to society. And so, long story short, I did what I did when I was a kid. I started drawing. And I, I, you know, I mean, I continued to draw in the military, I just didn't tell anybody. But after I got out, I uh, really started drawing, you know. There was a time where I was, uh, you know, homeless in, in, in Oakland, living, and I went to a, a group at the VA, and it was a group where somebody volunteered, and we would draw our traumas, and we would draw our traumas in these books, and we'd just leave the books on the uh, shelf, and then come back in two weeks and draw more traumas. 
And I felt like that was a very cathartic thing for me. And, and, and that was the first like real healing, you know, that I got. And I kind of piggybacked that. Well, I was also threatened by my, uh, you know, all the Vietnam vets in the group that said, if I don't use the GI Bill, they were going to get me. So, I mean, it was, they were joking, but, but, you know, a lot of them said they didn't use the GI Bill and um, that I should or else, you know, they're going to get me. And so I, I did, and I was going for history because that was my interest. You know, that's what I knew. I didn't really, I knew I liked to draw, so I took one drawing class, but then I found myself, like, hurrying up on my essays and hurrying up on all my readings so I could, you know, put more effort into this one drawing class. And then the next semester, I switched to all art classes. Um, this is a painting, The Hot Summer, uh, kind of thinking about, you know, my time in Minneapolis or, you know, the uprisings that... Uh, took place after I left around in my neighborhood um, as a result of the brutality of the fir third precinct. It's another painting, the March on Washington. And like the idea of creating these stories was always with me and it, and it was kind of a means of gaining agency. You know, that it was the one place in my life where I could control the narrative, I could control the story. So I found myself you know, spending a lot of time drawing, you know, throughout throughout my life. Um, but it, it really helped me, you know, after I, after I came back. And so I continue to create stories. And my, a lot of my work, you know, maybe it starts off in a personal place, but I, I like to, you know, expand it to, you know, um, you know confront things I, I, I see in the world, try to understand things. You know, I, I don't know too much, but, but I find myself you know, searching for, you know, a way to understand a lot of these things that I think maybe a lot of us can't understand. This is uh, In the Shadow of the Second Amendment, another painting. This is a Blacks and Blue painting, thinking about the uh, the history of the Buffalo Soldiers and, you know, kind of the um, cognitive dissonance or, or kind of the conflicts within oneself through, you know, um, different, I guess, me being being um, in between or, you know, uh, biracial or multiracial, kind of having, you know, these different groups within me, you know, that historically have, have fought or, you know, <clears throat> I was thinking specifically about the uh, Buffalo Soldiers um, engaging in a lot of, you know, I guess what now is agreed uh, on is uh, genocide against um, Native tribes in the West. This is uh, a painting. Um, I was thinking about, you know, kind of this moment where uh, people pour up. Or I was thinking about this... Uh, you know, thing that some some of my uh, friends do, or maybe I take part in. When I, you know, this uh, liquid uh, scissor or permethrazine, you know, this like liquid cough medicine that you know a lot of people you know maybe drink as a recreational drug. <laughs> um, <laughs> just think about this moment, you know, where even the police uh, are just drinking this, you know, uh, what we would call walkie. This is also a painting, I guess, in the same vein, thinking about like the the amount of people that have died from Minneapolis that were friends of mine from back home, and I was kind of thinking about this as like a, you know, maybe reinterpretation of the resurrection painting, and instead of Lazarus, uh, where you know Jesus commanding him to wake, it's it's the Narcan administered that um, brings the person back from the brink. And I think a lot of these people, I, I believe it's 11 names here kind of in the band, um, would be alive if Narcan was around when they uh, overdosed. This is another painting, um, Bury My Heart at 38th in Chicago. So this is the neighborhood I grew up. This is where uh, George Floyd was murdered by the police, not too far away from where me and my brother grew up, my brother actually had a was still living in a house like maybe about a half a block away from where this happened. 
So I just think about like these pillars of violence, or this, you know, these these pillars of um, of state violence or structural violence, where you know there's something that's built to potentially as a barrier, but also as a a, a, a pressure a oppressive measure against people. Um, I was thinking about maybe like the violence against black bodies, native bodies um, coinciding with the violence against the environment, and that's why I included this uh, furrow in there. Uh, this is El Alamin, this is going right back to my, my childhood, you know, kind of, you know, reliving these kind of battles, you know, so this is um, where uh, Montgomery fought uh, and, and a couple other British generals fought um, Erwin Rommel in the desert. And you just think about this idea of like trans, uh, these people, like outsiders coming to a land and fighting over it. It was a real interesting idea to me. This is a painting, the Alamo, uh, from my uh, show um, in Los Angeles recently, a party, party at Megiddo. We're thinking about this like party at the end of the world. What does that look like? Or what do we do at the end when there's nothing we can do? What, what do people do then? Do they just party? <laughs> I have an idea. Yeah, on the show, this is a painting here um, and another painting uh, uh, titled uh, Snipes, which a snipe is a cigarette that somebody would get, you know, from an ashtray to re-roll or to smoke themselves, like a used cigarette that someone smokes. Yeah, and there's kind of like a tradition of like painters, like, uh, or maybe graphic artists as well, like uh, Charles White um, doing drawings referring to this um, thing, or this idea of a, a snipe for this word. This is uh, a painting, um, at, at the right now at the Sashi Museum in London, um, which you know they approached me to you know be part of the show, and I thought I would have to do like think about some English battles, and I you know I had read about the I didn't want just the English you know um, were running the world or something, so I was thinking about these ideas of like black and native victories as well, and there's another show I'm taking part of right now, the uh, Longest Wars, where it's kind of thinking about these ideas of you know, parallels between, you know, the war on terror and um, the the genocide that happened to uh, ind indigenous people. But this is the Battle of Ishwalanda where uh, Zulu tribes um, defeated a, a British regiment and, you know, um, it's kind of one of the last times the, the British were there in South Africa because after that they were defeated by the Boer army. All right, hurry up. This is... Uh, <laughs> All dressed up and nowhere to go. Blood of the king. Purple rain. And the studio shot. Yay. This is my studio right now. I want to met the from the uh, headlands and uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I just feel really blessed to be here. Uh, really blessed to be making art. And thanks a lot. Oh. And I would like to uh, introduce the, the <laughs> illustrious, uh, great, sweet Carmen. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read mine, if I, if I can hold this up. Okay, okay. so um, I'm going to, these are vague things that I'm going to start out, like number one is time, and it'll just go on, you'll see. Okay, <clears throat> time. A painting forces us to stop and enter it, its time. A snapshot is something captured on film. The photo stops time. A painting encompasses time and is, a di is different each time we behold it. Even though it may seem static, it is ever-changing because... Dry fingers. Um, each time we encounter the painting, it is new or different in the way that we are constantly generating new cells. And paintings can never really be photographed. A photo captures the image. It misses the size, texture, and actual colors. Our bodies need to behold a painting in person to actually experience it. <clears throat> Much of what we do in the 21st century is governed by narcissistic culture. We are encouraged to create a false self 
one that can be apprehended or understood quickly, like so many images scrolling on a phone or a TV screen. Quickness, fastness keeps us in denial. We, um, we can order stuff on our phones, our computers or stores, which can instantly satisfy our wants. Amazon's instant delivery has made us impatient. The speed of images and desire ful fulfillment takes us out of our bodies. A painting is a stand-in for the body. As a beholder of art, a painting requires us to occupy real time, to be present and attentive. Makers of paintings and must also be present in order for the transfer of energy, which will become the paintings or the art object's core. Paintings can give off a palpable presence. It's my belief that work which is created from outside life lacks empathy and maintains a state of denial. Authenticity in art is a truth delivery system. Number two, our lives are spent making ourselves. Oh, this is building a self, number two. Our lives are spent making ourselves. In some random notes, I have a, a quote. It might be by Da Vinci, and it's this. Painting is the chief demonstration of humanity's intellectual dignity. Every once in a while, I'll just come over and do that. <laughs> it's fine with me. This phrase is an incredible permission giver, which massively empowers the painter. Painting is its own form of philosophy. It is here, it is here in our world, but not at the same time or space. It doesn't physically bump into us, like sculpture, you can bump into it. Um, it occupies and lives in a 2D flat world. We live in a 3D world. Painting thrives in the vast territory of our minds, our thoughts and feelings, things not seen by the naked eye. Painting is about pleasure and desire, not in the way that design or advertising sells desire. Uh, anyhow, it's not supposed to end up like that down. Um, painting's attraction is an invitation to belong, to discover what the painter and the viewer beholder can uncover about what they do not know. For me, painting is transformative. I believe it has the abil ability to change thoughts and invent uh, new ways of thinking. You can just, any time. Uh, <clears throat> as does any art making activity. This is one of the reasons art is so powerful. It is the territory of the unknown that we travel in. John Berger, a favorite writer of mine, um, says, for every painted image of something is also about absence of the real thing. So if it's a painting of a thing, it's not there. And um, all painting is about the presence of absence. I just love that. OK, how does painting create and build or build a self? As artists, we we have the ability to invent our own visual world. We learn to trust our instincts. In doing so, we give ourselves permission to make or paint what we want. We can follow our instincts and, in, and intuition and build the courage we need to continue being an artist. We can take risks. We can dare to reveal our secrets. I always pay attention to when I feel afraid, afraid that I might be revealing something that might expose my deepest thoughts or feelings. I try to stick with it, to follow my fear, to see where it leads. Painting has taught me not to be afraid of being an asshole. And I am one, by the way. It's OK with me. Or of exposing a secret. This enables me to not become risk averse. Painting is a very forgiving practice. I have learned that there are no mistakes in painting. It can, it can change in a flash. It can be covered over and new marks made. Um, I think it's true of all art making. Just We just have to accept it and figure out how to use our mistakes. My favorite paintings are ones that do not have a closed system, do not have all the answers. Its received content is discovered by the viewer beholder. Hopefully, they learn something about themselves. It can be as simple as realizing they don't like the color blue or that, they, or that a painting is too aggressive. I believe meaning in art is slippery and its meanings elastic. Not a single meaning, but a different, but different with each viewing by each individual viewer. Number three, intimacy. Making art is an act of int intimacy. It is an act of generosity to share with other humans. 
Looking at a painting is an incredibly intimate act. I recognize just how intimate while looking at Courbet's painting, The Origin of the World. Do you guys know what that is? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, for those who don't, it's a very close up shot of a woman um, below her waist and maybe up to the top of her thighs. And it's small, it's about this big. It's an incredible painting. And it was, um, it was commissioned by a uh, a guy named Bay, B-E-Y. <clears throat> Anyhow, uh, so the painting was a commitment. I just said that, okay. Da -da 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 -da. And um, so Courbet decided that it needed a cover so that it could always be secret. And he painted a second painting that was uh, sort of like, not a curtain, but it slid down over the original painting, over the origin. And that was a painting of a villa in snow. And it had, um, it had like, a weather vane on it that looks sort of like a cross. So you're so really, if you want to do a structuralist thing, just a shorthand, you have the hot of the figure, the the eroticism and the cold of the uh, of the house. You have inside, outside. It's just, it's like I think it's like the first conceptual art piece. Anyhow, uh, so that's that. I don't have to read that part. Um, Oh, I did good. Okay, so the second painting uh, of the villa became the high, the high, the was how the image was hidden. Um, okay. Oh, okay. I really, I did good by doing that fast. Okay. Um, looking at the image, the origin of the world in pu in a public space in a museum, I was self-conscious about my gaze, and was it okay to look at such an intimate image and like, like Jerry Saltz just did a thing recently about how, to, how artists look at stuff. And we get like nose to the painting. We want to smell it. We want to get really close to see what we're looking at. And when you're doing that in public to something like an image of a crotch, that's another deal altogether. <laughs> it's a good teacher is what, anyhow. And okay, so Courbet is an incredibly sensuous painter. <laughs> The optic is wedded to the haptic. His touch guides our eyes over the entire surface. The second example of understanding the intimacy of looking is Duchamp's Etant Donnet. Uh, do you all know where that is? It's a it's a, a installation piece that resides in the um, Philadelphia Museum of Art. It's a, a, sort of the last major thing Duchamp made. Uh, and. I believe that Duchamp knew that Courbet was the guy to be or best because Duchamp's paintings are really, I think they're awful. They're brown, they're kind of tobacco stained. They just aren't, they're dryly painting. They're not really juicy. And his sculpture, however, is extremely sensual. And what makes his, it's his intelligence that makes the work really sexy. So Duchamp's final piece, Etant Dunny, is very much influenced by Courbet's origin. I, I, this is my own theory, by the way. Oh, I don't think that. Anyhow, um, and uh, Duchamp created a space that is visible only by peeking through a peephole. <laughs> and it's a wooden, thick wooden door. It might have two holes, but it might just have one. And you put your eye up to it, and you can smell the lanolin of all the skin that's been up against this. Mm -hmm. And you can, all, you can only see so much through that hole. It's really fantastic. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, and when one looks into the opening, the very small opening, you see a waterfall, which to me resembles some of Courbet's uh, landscape paintings of the rural area he grew up in. And there's a woman sort of face down with a crooked wig, um, and she's holding a lamp. It's, you really all should go to Philadelphia, make a pilgrimage there to see it. Anyhow, it's a good piece to learn about um, how looking is an intimate act. Number four, history. All art is historical. It's a historical human document. It reveals your time on the planet. It is, it's an act of generosity on the part of the artist to share, to give the viewer beholder your version of your view of life, the handed down world as well as the specificity of your own unique experience. History is incomplete if our work is not included. For too long we have looked at artwork made by a handful, a very small portion of artists, primarily men, and um, 
Anyhow, and all artists are making work that is about our shared history. So we should see not just one view from one group, we should have it available from everybody who's making stuff. Historical records are incomplete without the artwork. That is why it's important for artists to make things. Visual cul culture is a complicated and necessary addition to recorded history. It tells stories in ways only artists can. We all want to be seen, to be heard, to be remembered. We all want to belong. As artists, we have the ability to create our own world and make it accessible to people and to share it. It is an awesome power to be an artist. It's a huge privilege. Art will teach you to trust yourself and how you see life and the world. And what artists do is more than make stuff. They are making a permanent record of being here. This is, the, this is true of ephemeral art and performance art, too. The energy <clears throat> of the artist gets transferred to the viewer beholder. What happens is below language, something felt, perhaps without a name something known intuitively. Artists are doing important work. The energy they create has a healing potential. We need to be ready to accept it, to surrender to it. And that's that. <laughs> so this is part two of our program, um, which will include questions that were submitted by audience members in advance. Um, so some of this is connected to things that we have heard um, Gregory and Squeak speak about. Um, and some of it is not. Um, we really appreciate everybody who had the or, or took the opportunity to um, to send questions in. Um, I just want to start by thanking Squeak and Gregory um, for you know, really being so open and sharing um, in the way that you did. Um, and, and I want to say that even though he has questions, if you feel that you're not getting a question, you can <laughs> interrupt. I'm serious. I, I, I second that. It's more fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So feel free to follow up on questions, shout questions out. Um, and um, we will also have, for, for anybody who doesn't feel comfortable shouting out a question, do know that at the end we've built in time for questions from yeah. all of you as well. Yeah. Um, so there are multiple opportunities and we encourage you to take advantage of any or all. Oh, now you can hear <laughs> Nice. All right, the first question. Um, life after grad school. What keeps you motivated to keep creating? Anger. <laughs> anger, tell us more. I like to make Ang anger my friend. Um, but, you know, when I got the SECO Award, is this thing on? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, when I got the SECO Award, people came up to me, I don't know if this happened to you, and said, Oh, that's the kiss of death. It's really too bad you got that. And then, <laughs> then somebody's husband, wife came up and said, my husband should have gotten that. So people aren't very encouraging necessarily. So that's why you have to make anger your friend and work really hard to get what you want done, done. Gregory, Gregory, as a recent SICA recipient <laughs> and a recent graduate, Hello. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't. I, it never. It never occurred to me that the, it, it was an option to just stop. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like so like in tune with like that's my outlet and like my job in a lot of ways and I've just been doing it. Like I, I don't know how I would like navigate through the world without like trying to you know um, participate in you know. Uh, making art or that tradition yeah I I, I I tried when when I was in the army you know I, I tried to quit drawing but even then I would draw at night you know like under the the bed with my red light on and uh, and I create these little like goddesses and put in my helmet to like protect me um, so I think if I quit then I wouldn't have any protection yeah and I also think art making art is how we figure out who we are and where we are and how we live and how we understand the world and um, and as an art and being an artist is an incredible privilege and that's why I think we need to that we get to do this you know to like we live in our world every day in a really deep way more than any other way I think of anything because it's like totally comes from us and then it's a thing this art object and um, and it 
helps us figure out who we are and I lost my thought on that. <laughs> no, it's great. I mean, and I think you, you both, your practice reflects really, you know, your interests in history and your interests in the personal and trying to sort of interweave that um, in your work. Um, I mean, Gregor, you talked about drawing and how that gives you agency to do so many things. And Squeak, you talk about painting. Um, I guess it leads to a question about um, sort of marks in your paintings a little bit too, which is um, in both cases, you guys use a lot of text in your work. Um, and so can you speak a little bit about the use of text or when you choose to use it, when you choose to exclude it? Um, what's your relationship to the written word? Uh, yeah, um, I don't know, I've been writing for a long time. And that's like one of the ways I can, like feel like I can communicate, but like when I would use a word in a painting or something, it, it's not like a literal word. Right. It, it, it's, it's just something to keep something else. You know, it's another, almost like where words become visual mm -hmm. or, or something like that. Or that's kind of the way I think about it. I feel like they're visual too. And um, they can be, have something to do with something that's in the painting, or they can not at all. They can just kind of throw it off. And I may not know the connection, or I may know the connection. And um, were you told you couldn't ever put words in paintings? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, because, you know, by the time you came. Yeah. I, was, I was very young and um, at one point. And um, <laughs> it's been a long time. And I was always told I couldn't put words in the paintings. And I would do these, little, these sketches of a painting I was going to start, and I have I'd write things in there and then I just decided to that when it occurred to me what I was making I could put it in the thing I was making I didn't have to have I didn't have to have a sketchbook I never I start from ground zero I don't know what I'm gonna do I like it that way um, and then I then I figure out what I'm doing and a lot of times I'll do something spend a lot of time on something and then totally cover it over so one painting is usually not one painting. There's usually a bunch behind it. But um, I love the way handwriting looks. I love the way, uh, like I love Persian miniatures for the same reason. I can't read them, but I think that the calligraphy is so beautiful. And um, I'm just going to tell you about my handwriting briefly. Because Please, yes. Because I use it on purpose. It looks like Son of Sam. Um, <laughs> And my mother, when she was dying of cancer, my brother, who came to visit her once in this whole time that she was in the hospital, um, and I was there like every day. I was at Yaddo, and I would visit her, you know, every day at the end of the day or whenever. And she and he came, and she said, "He's a really good pillow fluffer." Oh, gee. And I said, "Why don't you have him come more often?" And then. Um, uh, then she said he wrote these letters for me. I dictated, and he wrote. And I said I could do that. That I could. It'd be, I'd ha be happy to do that for you. And she said, Oh no, your handwriting is way too awful. <laughs> <laughs> now I want you to know that my brother wrote so hard that he embossed the thing underneath the paper, and it was not pretty. So I don't understand. Anyhow. That's just, that's just a sideline. <laughs> right behind you is some text that said, make anger your friend yeah. in, in your handwriting. So yeah. we'll, we'll take that as truth. Um, I, I think similarly in relation to that, and sort of maybe as a process question, but you're talking about the layering of text mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and sometimes it working as image in a way. Yeah. Um, I think in your work, Squeak, and in Gregory, in your work, there is this layering that's built up physically of, you know, mark upon mark, or um, Gregory, maybe more so in your case, sort of material upon material. Um, can you talk a little bit about why that's an important part of your process? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so I, I, I think, like, there's, like, these moments that I, like, look at in, 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 in like my mind of like, uh, stuff that I thought was beautiful or stuff that really was awe inspiring to me. And like, like a reoccurring one is, you know, when I was young, maybe a teenager and I went under this bridge and it was like this long bridge for the Sears building, um, in, in Minneapolis. And, uh, 
where they unloaded stuff like underneath the sear, so it was super long. But there was like parts, it, and it was like ages and ages of graffiti, and 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 there was like parts where there would be water coming down, and it would start to peel away, and it would be like these layers would be like revealing themselves from like a time, you know, probably before I was born, and yeah, that's what I I think about for for like the the feel of my paintings. You know, I, I can I can never like achieve that, but that's like one of the, like I feel like I have all these ideas that I, I push towards that like are maybe like my ideas of beauty or what I, what I think uh, looks good, I guess. So I, I think I want my paintings to have um, a sense that they're, they've been there, come back, and then, they, you know, that they're, that they've existed kind of for a long time. And so that sense of history that's built into a painting is really important to me. And also, um, I really like to mush the paint around mm -hmm. and um, scrape it off or cover it over because it gives it, it just gives it more body to me. I just want it to be like that. I don't have a really good answer. It's like a map. Yeah. Uh, for the image, right? So, so you create a painting. It's a still thing. Yeah. Is 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 still, but it, it's a lot of movement that went into making it, and maybe we uh, let the movement maybe be visible a, a little yeah. bit more than some. Maybe some some artists m might want to erase that, and you know, that's that's rad too. But I I, I think um, that I like to see this history building up. Me too. And um, you shared, um, both of you shared a photo of your studio, and there's a question about the studio practice and your studio life and processes, and you know maybe that ties in a little bit to this layering as well. But um, I've had the opportunity more recently, Gregory, to visit your studio on, on campus here, um, and the photo you showed here was of the headlands, um, and there, that layering exists there too. You know, there's. Um, and I guess the question really is, you know, are you working on one work at a time? Are you working on multiple works at a time? Can you talk a little bit about the experience of being in your studio? Um, for me, I have to work on a lot of things at once because when one thing, get, when I get stuck on one, I go to another one. And sometimes going to that other one is going to tell me what I need to do about this one over here. And then I have pieces of paper that I put when I, I put up blank canvases and um, start when I, I just did this recently. I mostly just keep adding and moving them into moving finished ones into a different room. And um, anyhow, but now lately I put up a whole bunch of raw, can, you know, nothing on them canvases, and um, I'm working from one to the other. And I put every time I I put a piece of paper up, and the paper is um, sort of I take notes. I make images, I um, try to put colors on them, and they're sort of like the, um, the history or diary of the paintings. And some of the material ends up in the paintings and some of it doesn't. And I have hundreds of these things, and they look like a crazy person did them, so I call them the crazy papers. Mm -hmm. And I love these things because they have my handwriting that my mother so disliked. <laughs> and um, because they have an immediacy that's different than the paintings. Um, you know, like the way a pencil burrs out on the edge, it's really subtle, but depending on whether the, paint, the paper is smooth or has a texture on it, it's different than what paint is. And so, and so I love them for that reason. And uh, anyhow, I think that's, yeah, that's how my studio works right now. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, in mine, I'm, I don't know if I'm trying to eradicate the idea or that the eradication of the idea is something maybe that I would applaud is this idea of progress. Mm -hmm. Or like these linear, linear narratives, like A, B, and C happen, and then we got the nuclear bomb, yeah. you know, or something like that, uh, and that's progress. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like, it, it, and I, I have to take some of the like, um, Sometimes materials can be charged, right? 
and, and you buy these materials in art store and you know they're kind of just bought and it's like a product of manufacturing like every other thing in my life and but this is like you know my special place you know this isn't like brushing my teeth or something this is like my 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 special place so i, I feel like if i kind of degrade the materials almost or you know be able to throw them around or be able to walk on paintings or you know that because if it becomes too lofty I can't really work on it you know I'll just roll it up um, so yeah and and I feel like there is a certain rhythm you get into as well where you're not like you don't want to be restrained by I got to clean up shifting Gears just a little bit. There's a question, just some questions about your career in a way. Um, what were some of the first steps you took to establish a career in art? Um, and given that you're both here in the Bay Area, um, does the Bay influence? Does the Bay Area influence the way you work? Um, and is there ongoing pressure to move to another city such as LA or New York? Uh, I don't. I don't have any pressure to move to LA. I mean, that's, that's pretty close. The, it's like 45 minute plane ride and then, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel like as far as like art career, it just, it just seems kind of like, uh, I don't know. I, I like to keep that at arm's distance. Like, I, I don't even know if I recognize myself as having an art career. I, I just try to, you know, pay one bill, you know, after, after the other. Um, I do feel, like, extremely, like, blessed or lucky, you know, that, that I can be doing something that I, that I like and, and, you know, that I really, like, look forward to and, like, like, waking up a couple hours early to, like, go to the studio for a couple hours early is, like, something I'm, I'm always trying to do rather than, you know, hitting snooze like again and again but yeah it's expensive here though yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, but I if I moved I couldn't replace my studio because I we have a great building that we got years ago when we were young and stupid and um, only had barely a down payment for it and it was um, owner financed and so anyhow we've managed to make it work but um, I, do, I miss the East Coast to this day, and I've been here over 50 years. Oh. I really love the winter, <laughs> and I, I just, I like the East Coast. I like the, I like the trees there way better than I like them here. I think they're too big here. <laughs> I think that the mountains in the East Coast are lovely because they're all old and run down, and they're intimate, and I feel like it's just a, a gentler, kinder <laughs> environment. Um, but, uh, and I don't like, I, I don't like to, you know, like I've had students who make a painting and they go, well now can I, what gallery should I take this to? Oh, <laughs> and I think there's been too much attention paid on, you know, making it public and um, putting it in galleries and stuff and making it a product, a sell. And I don't, I mean, I think art can sell, that's not, you know, we want to make a living or we want to be able to support our habit. And, um, but I think that you can do it without having that thing, the career thing, in sort of the forefront of your brain. Because I think it's going to fuck with you if you do that. I think it's, and it's going to be bad. And it's going, it's going to take you out of where you need to be. That's, that other stuff is just all, a lot of it's luck. It's nice if people like things. I don't believe anybody does. You know, I, I just refuse to because I don't want to, I don't want to get a big head or anything. Um, and I want to keep my own uh, counsel. I don't want somebody to tell me if something works or doesn't work. I want to be the person who decides that. And so I'm really stubborn about that. Um, yeah. Oh, can, I, can I say something? Yeah. Of course. I mean, like, I, I, I feel you there's like like the idea of success being um, kind of tied to some kind of monetary success um, and it's like almost anathema to me like 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 I, I, I feel like that's maybe when you lost is when you, you start making stuff for a particular market yeah instead of it being about the work because I mean if I 
I feel like it's I was talking to you like oh so and so but this painting or this painting um, I've had artists do that with me and I'm going wow anyhow they but make products I feel like I'm always like in a battle with like trying to make something that I think is good and it just never happens or it'll happen for like a little bit of time you know like a, overnight and I'll look at it in the morning and be like oh it's terrible <laughs> and, and that's, I don't, I don't know. see now I won't go to bed if I think something's bad because I, I'm sure that it's going to multiply to worse <laughs> overnight. So I will do things like, I'll put a great big X across it. It doesn't matter. Because there's no mistakes in paintings. You just do whatever the fuck you want, and then you go to sleep, and it's really nice. And you wake up, and sometimes what you did was really going to be great and really usable way more than it was if you'd left it to multiply. And then the, the other thing I think artists should do is, um, as young artists, like, you can make, like, I made up studio, this, uh, open studio things. I didn't do them when other people did them. I did sometimes. But I preferred to, like, send out a postcard and say that the studio was going to be open for, um, you know, like, from, for the afternoon on a Sunday. <clears throat> and people thought that it was a real thing. And um, they, they would see me and say, oh, I'm so sorry I missed your show. And I'm going like, well, it was just, you know, you would have walked in and walked out. You could have just looked around and whatever. It wasn't, it wasn't like a real thing like people think of a real thing. And I, and I would sit and read the New York Times, the Sunday New York Times, and I sent these cards to people I didn't know. And they would come up and they'd go, are you the artist? I said, no, I'm just babysitting for an artist, you know, so. Because <laughs> I just, I want the paintings or what, to be their thing. I don't really want to be the, I don't know what you'd call it, but the paintings are their thing. Um, so, so related, but maybe a, a little bit of a foil to that is, um, there's a question about your teaching experience um, and how long you know, we, you spent teaching, Gregory, you have begun teaching more recently. Um, and I think people would love to hear about that experience as a teacher and, you know, how you think it fits maybe into your career as an artist. Um, and if one serves There's, the other. Or... Some people say those who can do, those who can't teach. So, you know, I, I don't you agree say that? with that. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I made it with. Uh, at some point um, at CCAC, there was um, a painting was dead, and so I made a um, uh, a bumper sticker that said, "Those who can paint, those who can't do shop," and, <laughs> and passed them out to the painting faculty. Um, but uh, so when I, I what I like is I like to share information. I'm I, I'm more interested in that than like um, controlling what people do. I don't want them to make work like mine. I, in fact, before the internet, they had no idea who I you know what my work was because I didn't show it to them. And um, I um, I would bring paints. I provided a lot of paints because they didn't have this. I had this great job and it. Um, it helped pay for the habit of being a, you know, being able to do my work, and um, it so I could have a lot of supplies there, and they could experiment more. And I would try to get them. My whole thing about teaching was um, helping them build courage instead of being afraid and worrying about what people think, and um, trying to get them to see what they were doing. And, I'm I'm more interested in that than a than than creating a product. But. I feel like teaching holds like a great amount of responsibility and yeah. and that sometimes scary, you know. And, and and there's like a balance there of being like involved or being hands off to let people develop, you know, their own work. <laughs> or you don't want everybody just making paintings like Squeak, or making paintings or like, you know, who, who, whoever. And so I feel like every person m maybe that is drawn to like make some kind of art, you know, I'd say a painting class, because you know, that's make a painting is, um, 
you know, has a, has a painting to create, you know, so, somewhere yeah. within their history or within, within themselves. And I, I don't want to get in the way of that. But I, yeah, I feel like teachers have been very instrumental in me, in, if, instrumental for me in, in a bunch of different, I guess, facets of my life and times in my life. And, you know, I just want to be there in case I'm needed, you know, and maybe someday I could, you know, somebody will talk about me like that. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. That would be awesome. I'm sure they already are. So I'm sure they are. Um, are there audience questions that um, you would like to pose to Squeak and Gregory? Yay. So when you um, start the sketch, in your case, Squeak. Do we want to use the mic? Yeah. yeah. Start the sketch, yeah. I don't do any sketches. No, I, I, oh. meant, I meant those pieces of paper you were talking about. Oh, the, the crazy papers, yeah. Papers. Um, by the way, I'm looking for an archive to sell them to. The whole, all, the whole set and everything that goes after it, if, they, if the person was to buy them today. Oh. All right. I have, I have a couple, actually, from, uh, it's called History of Paintings, I think, of yours, mm -hmm. from way back when. Um, but, and they're great. How much do you think about other artists when you start? When I start painting? Yeah, are, now, when you're starting something, are they like in your head, or do you, you have the whole history of art behind you, you know, behind your head. Do you think about it at all, or you just, mm. how can you not, I guess? It's well, it's just there, because I go look at a lot. I love, the, my favorite thing is to go to a museum and be there for the whole day, right. and just look at stuff that I haven't seen. And I love to travel to go to museums, and um, I love to try to figure out what I think how somebody made something, and um, and I get inspired by it. But when I start a painting, it, it's not there. Uh, it's just it's sort of um, it's digested by then, I guess. This is uh, mostly for Squeak. Can you tell us a little bit about who your mentors were and being oh, yeah. a, a woman? And I know that um, Joan Brown maybe was a little bit of an influence. Yeah, so um, I, I always thought that Juan Miro, because it was spelled J-O-A-N, was a woman. <laughs> because I'm always I'm going, how come they're all men? And I, I was the oldest of six, and the, the next four were all boys, and um, they had all the power and the you know, I mean, I could beat them up, but it's but they had the they had a power that I didn't have because it's a that's the kind of world we live in. And um, <clears throat> anyhow, so I did, I had a couple uh, in high school. There was a woman who was really encouraging, and, and when the regular art teacher was on sabbatical or something, I don't know where, and she was great. The regular teacher was terrible. She um, she she had us paint. She wanted us to paint a picture of a pond, and I did, and I loved it. It was watercolor. I really liked it a lot. But she never liked any of my work. And um, <clears throat> she she said, you know, if you put a duck in that painting, <laughs> I'll give you an A. Oh my. So I put a fucking duck in that painting. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like Trojan duck. It was all the and you know with watercolor you can't just take it out. But I thought that I then my if I happen to have a it was one of these classrooms where there were like you know freshmen here or seniors here and like uh, ninth graders here and in the ninth grade part was uh, one of my brothers the brother who's the 18 months younger than me. And he knew that I was really, really mad. And so in the washing room, the little wash-up room at the back of the class, he came in and started teasing me and like getting, you know, making me madder and madder. Yes. And because he was the charming boy, um, I, he did not get sent to the principal's office. I did. But when I got there, I told the principal that I thought Miss Weirman was not a very good teacher because she wanted me to put it put a duck in my painting, which didn't belong in my painting. My painting was fine before I put that duck in there. And by the way, Susie's not doing anything. She's not making paintings right now. She was just a really good copyist, but she wasn't involved in her work. 
and that you want somebody to be. It has to come from here, anyhow. Um, then, so then I went to uh, I went to a junior college, and they were all men. And um, people used to draw on your work. They don't do that now. No, it's no. bad. I used to carry around tracing paper in case somebody wanted to see what needed to be done, be, and then take the paper away so they couldn't use it. So they'd have to make it themselves. So um, we don't do that anymore. And then, uh, then I went to CCAC. And the reason I went to CCAC is because I went and looked at the Art Institute, and everybody was so cool. They were like, I smoked cigarettes at the time, but like they were very, very, very cool beret, the whole thing. And they wouldn't talk to you. I mean, you know, just like say hi or anything. I was just looking at the school. I wasn't going to do anything to them. Anyhow, <laughs> and then, um, so then we crossed the bridge and went over to CCAC, and I had been, I'd done a lot of ceramics because um, in the, Women's junior college I went to, that was how they taught sculpture, so you made sculpture. And at, at Goddard, it was the wheel, and then at CCAC it was everything. So I went in there, um, and there was this woman in the kiln, and that was Viola Fry. And Viola and I talked, and Gary, we were there for like three hours. And I walked out of there, I said, Gary, I want to go to school here. He said, but what about, he's from San Francisco. He said, but we can't live here. I said, oh yeah, I'm going to walk to school. I'm not going to commute. <laughs> we can live here. And now he's the biggest Oakland boost, booster I know. So Viola was, and, and I went to go register for the classes. And, the cha and they used to have card tables. It was before computers. This is how old I am. <laughs> and, um, there was and, a question about social media use, but we didn't quite get there. No good, don't go there. So, so anyhow, um, they were card tables, and every department had a card table, and they would register people into their classes like that. They had pieces of paper and blah, blah, blah. And so um, he said, no, there's no more ceramic classes. But why don't you go talk to that woman over there? And that woman over there was the woman in the kiln. And I went up to her and I said, um, he said you would have, you could get me into some ceramics classes, and she said, "Oh yes, I saved you three classes." So uh -huh. Viola was really, really supportive. And then I dropped out of school. I don't have an undergrad degree because I had this wacky idea that if I really made a good portfolio, I could get into a graduate school, and we call it life experience. <laughs> this, is, this is how my mind works, and. Um, and I'm trying to do it with some other stuff. It's called manifesting. Work on it, you can do it too. <laughs> Anyhow, so um, I, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, was Joan oh. Brown an influence? No, in wait a second. Some, yeah. Grad school, yes. Oh, yeah. but that was good. That was getting closer. That brought them closer in time. That was very good. So anyhow, so, uh, so I went, I was out of school for a couple of years. And I went and talked to Viola. I applied to the Art Institute. The stuff was in boxes. They didn't tell you you could put it up on a wall or anything like that. And, um, and then I went over, I, I went and talked to Viola and I said, you know, I want to apply to grad school, but I don't want to waste my $25 if I'm not going to get in. And she said, oh, you'll get in. I said, okay. So, so I did get into grad school without an undergrad degree and I didn't have to make up those three units that I was missing or whatever. So Viola was, re the only reason I have a teaching job with a pension is because Viola let me into grad school. Because you have to have the terminal degree. Um, the MFA, now it's PhD sometimes. Um, and then uh, I was working at CCAC, loading kilns, firing them, and mixing glazes. And, um, uh, I'd had some work at Hanson Fuller Golding, like, and Joan Brown saw it, and she called me up and she said, you know, I, I've seen your paintings. I think you'd be a good sabbatical replacement, and if you want to apply, I'll go to bat for you. And I did, and she did. And so I taught for a year there, and she was really terrific. Um, she was, I really liked her a lot. She was great. So, and then, um, from there, I went to, uh, I applied to Davis. And at Davis, 
they were looking for a painter. They hired two of us. This was to replace the uh, Roy DeForest job. Mm -hmm. One guy and me. He got hired at a higher pay rate, mm -hmm. I found out years later, but they made good on it. Um, or this, I got paid anyhow. Uh, and um, they hired, and, it, and so I always say it took two of us to replace Roy DeForest. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyhow, and then, uh, and oh, when I was a grad student, uh, um, Jay DeFeo was uh, working at CCAC, and so I was friends with her after that, and um, she was like really supportive. They, it was really great having women that actually paid attention to you, and it wasn't. It was just about the work. It was really, that was really valuable. I think that's all, enough of that. Another question from, the, oh yeah, there's a bunch. Uh, I can just talk loud. Okay, go ahead. I have a question is when I go and look at painting, uh -huh. I can be so taken by a painting, yeah. and then when I go and read it, I, I have, there's another level to Oh, you that. mean when there's text in it? When there's something okay. written about the painting. And what does it do? No, it brings, it's more of like, oh, oh I didn't see that. Oh, do you mean that. a review of it? Oh, the, what the docent writes. Oh, 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 what don't listen to that. <laughs> oh, but here's my question about that. You as an artist, mm -hmm. do you have input into that is one, and two, Depends. how do you feel about having that? Since do you want your paintings to not have that level of, oh, now I see that. I Would like rather the viewer to not have that. So it's just that so kind of thing I that like, I'm from both of you wondering. I like um, no labels actually, because I I think it looks cleaner to have just the artwork on the walls. Um, sometimes we, pr I mean, they'll, somebody will ask us or show us what they're going to write about it. I don't like them anybody to explain too much. Um, but you know, for some people, they really need that. I don't need that, I don't care about it, because I'm willing to make shit up. So I think that's what we should all do. Because you're not really making it up. It's, you're, it's generated by what you're looking at. And it's, it's tri triggering something that you already know, and it's just, or don't know, or why have a question about. And, it, and that's valid. It has to be. Otherwise, it's not gonna work. Gregory, do you have a perspective on that? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't read them. Um, I got I got nine or twelve uh, uh, labels at, at the the SFMO right now for the Sika show. I haven't read any of them. And they asked me what I think about them. I said, Oh, they're great. <laughs> and, and, and I did that with interviews too. I mean, recently I started reading the interviews because I mean that can bring in other people. You know, if you started talking about. You know, like history or family, and they get something wrong. It's like you know, like that becomes like a fact. Yeah. So, like I'll, I'll read them, or, or, or my wife Carly, she'll uh, she'll read them sometimes. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't like to read them. They make me feel weird. Uh -huh. uh, yes, one question up here. About work, oh yeah, I'll talk. No, no, not in the museum. Okay. Uh, not on the walls. Okay. No. By good writers. Come, come look at the carpet. Um, I have a question, Gregory. It's, um, I'm an artist and I have like this little space in my house where I can create art. But there's something so moving to me about large artwork and the scale of both of what you do. Um, could you talk about size and how, um, I don't know, like how inspirational size can be as a viewer and then for you as artists? Um, why why do you do larger scale pieces and, and what do you think about that idea? Don't you do small, medium, and large? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I, I feel like maybe it's the seriality that happens within a large piece that could be like a number of smaller pieces and I think about like even like these like small like spaces to work and I think about like like Jacob Lawrence or something in, in the, the uh, migration series. And this is all made, you know, on these little kind of almost uh, eight and a half by 11 size-ish, you know, panels. And, and it, I mean, you could make those just like at a table. I think like it, it could be a number of little things or it could be a big thing. And um, yeah, I kind of like this 
like a bunch of different like stories happening um, or, or aspects of a story and, and that's kind of what attracts me and I feel like I was working the same way on littler paper but it was just about seriality and it's about like kind of putting these, these um, stories together after the fact. All right, I think we have time for one last question. Anybody? 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 Yes. Do you always work on flat canvas and then stretch it later? Do I work on? You work on flat canvas flat and then canvas. stretch it later? No, I, I like to have it on. Uh, I work. Um, I used to have them stretched and then hung them up. Now I have them stretched over a panel because too many knuckles went through the back and then years later you get a circular crack. So this now they're sort of like frisbees. They're tough, so it's better. <laughs> but when you work, it's just on the camera. Oh, no, I put them on the wall. I stand all day. I love it. I like to walk around. I don't like to sit and paint. I didn't even like when I was teaching for students to sit down because I thought they should, like, you know, stand up so they can move around. So I like to do that. And it works really teeny and medium and whatever size I want, yeah. But he's right. You know, the big ones you can fall into. There's something about the scale that's like, you know, like a king-size bed or something. It's like that kind. It's big like that. And I want it to surround me. So I have a thing all about scale in my head. Of course I do, yeah. <laughs> so small is like the size of your head. Medium is the hardest size because it covers from your head, to all those orifices, to your to the bottom of to your crotch, to, to all the body orifices. So I believe, at least how I was raised, I believe that that's we censor that size much more. We're not as bold in there. It's unconscious. It's a Puritan hang, you know, holdover, and I think it's a real I, like. You know, Rembrandt's are that size, but he's only working with the head and shoulder mostly. And also it was a different time, and he doesn't have the Puritans on his back, you know, or, or in his history. So, and then, um, then lar so large you can fall into, small as the side of your head, yeah. So that's my theory of size. Gregory, any quick uh, specifics on that? Uh, yeah, I think a, a small painting can be just as powerful as a big painting. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times you can find you can you can have a more intimate moment with with a yeah. smaller painting, um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, hopefully, I can get you know maybe I can get good at painting someday and make some small paintings that you know have have some uh, <laughs> like um, effect as a big painting. But sometimes I feel like uh, I don't know. Maybe yeah, I feel like that's that's maybe the more more advanced. Do you work? Um, do you work big only right now, or pretty much the size that's like in the show? No, no, I, I work small. Okay. I work small on uh, on uh, probably eight eight by ten mm -hmm. and up on paintings, and mm -hmm. then I make like really small drawings oh, sometimes, okay. and up to really big drawings. Mm -hmm. um, I hate to cut us off. I'm I know that there are probably additional questions, but I did. I do remember hearing either Squeak or Gregory say um, at a recent meeting about how art should be about questions and not about answers. And so I think that um, this is clearly, you know, this conversation is indicative of that. I think, and you've <laughs> given us all kinds of questions to continue thinking about. Um, I'm super grateful, Gregory and Squeak, for taking the time to be here with us today and sharing as personally as you did. Um, we're very excited to uh, to see more from you and to see your work um, again soon. And for those of you that haven't seen the Sika show, um, make sure you get a chance to see that too. Um, there's great work in general in that show as well. Uh, but thank you, everybody, for being here as well. Thank you.